गुड मॉर्निंग डियर स्टूडेंट्स वी नो दैट देर आर थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ कोऑर्डिनेट्स यूज इन फाइनेट एलिमेंट मेथड दे आर ग्लोबल कोऑर्डिनेट्स लोकल कोऑर्डिनेट्स एंड नेचुरल कोऑर्डिनेट्स ग्लोबल कोऑर्डिनेट्स आर यूज टू स्पेसिफाई द पॉइंट्स इन द एंटायर स्ट्रक्चर Local coordinates are used to specify the point on an element. Global coordinates we are using to derive the global properties or the properties of the domain. Local coordinates we use to derive element properties. These element properties are assembled to obtain the global properties ultimately the global properties are obtained in terms of global coordinates right no. natural coordinates natural coordinates are the derived coordinates they are used to derive the element properties their values never exceed unity and at any point on the element the sum of the natural coordinates is unity to specify any point on the element we can use the natural coordinate hence the natural coordinates are considered as local coordinates right now we shall see the natural coordinate j the natural coordinate j for one dimension problems the natural coordinate j is used the value of natural coordinate j lies between minus 1 and plus 1 the value of natural coordinate j lies between minus 1 and plus 1 the length of any element is varied as j varies from minus 1 to plus 1 the length of any element is covered as j varies from minus 1 to plus 1 the length of any element is covered as j varies from minus 1 to plus 1 right now we derive the natural coordinate j to derive the natural coordinate j we take an element connecting two nodes 1 and 2 1 and 2 we have a global coordinate axis a reference frame global reference frame with coordinate axis x with coordinate origin o i take the coordinate origin o here right now the point 1 is distant x1 units from the coordinate origin o the point 2 that is node 2 is distant x2 units from the coordinate origin o therefore the length of the element is covered as x varies from x1 to x2 now the length of the element l equals to x2 minus x okay. i told you that the length of the element is covered as z varies from minus 1 to plus 1 therefore at node 1 j equals to minus 1 make correction this is minus not plus 1 At node two, j equal to plus one. At the midpoint of the element, j equals to zero because length of the element is covered as j varies from minus one to plus one. At the midpoint, j equals to zero. Understand? Careful. Now, if you determine the midpoint coordinate or the coordinate of the midpoint C. 
What is the coordinate of midpoint C? Simply x1 plus x2 by 2. If you measure the distance of C from the coordinate origin O, you get x1 plus x2 by 2. Okay. Now, I take a point of interest say P distant x units from the coordinate origin. Distant x units from the coordinate origin. P is distant x units from the coordinate origin. Right? What is my interest to derive the natural coordinate j for any point in the element? Okay. How I define? I define j as Pc by x2 minus x1 by 2. What is x2 minus x1 by 2? Half the length of the element. Half the length of the element. That is distance of 2 from C. You can take. Half the length of the element. Distance of 2 from C. That is x2 minus x1 by 2. Okay. Now, the distance of P from the coordinate origin. That is x. Now, PC, distance of P from C, how much it is? Distance of P from C is simply X minus X1 plus X2 by Observe carefully. Distance of P from the coordinate origin is X. Distance of C from the coordinate origin is Tell me how much? x1 plus x2 by 2. Therefore, pc, pc equals to x minus of x1 plus x2 by 2. In place of pc, you can write x minus of x1 plus x2 by 2. Therefore, j, j we get which equals to pc by l by 2. L is x2 minus x1. Now, PC, how you write? PC you can write like this. Again, if you go back, PC, PC equals to x minus x. What is x? Distance of C from the coordinate origin. O. Distance of C from the coordinate origin. O. That is xc. So, therefore, x minus xc x minus xc by l by 2, where l is the length of the element. This equals to 2 by l into x minus, I said no, x equals to x1 plus x2 by 2. This is x1 plus x2 by 2, which equals to 2 by l into x minus. Now, this x1 plus x2 is written like this. How it is written to this? What I do is, I add x1 and I subtract x1. Do we observe any change? No. Because I am adding x1 and I am subtracting x1. Then, what you get here in the numerator? x1 plus x1. 2x1 x plus x2 minus x1. Therefore, there is no change in the numerator by 2. Now, the coordinate, natural coordinate j, j, natural coordinate j equal to 2 by L into x minus, what is x2 minus x1 length of the element? L plus 2x1 by 2, which equals to 2 by L into, if you simplify this, so what you get? x minus x1 minus L by 2. If you expand this, what do you get? x minus L by 2 plus 2x1 by 2. Plus 2x1 by 2. Minus is there. Understand? Be careful. x minus L by 2 minus 2x1 by 2. Therefore, you get 2 by L into x minus x1 minus L by 2. Now, the natural coordinate j equal to 2 by L into x minus x1 minus L by L. Okay? Now, take this 2 by L to the left side. Then, L by 2 into j equals to x minus x1 minus L by L. Okay? 
Now, take this minus L by 2 to the left side. Then what do we get L by 2 into 1 plus J equals to X minus X1. In the next step, what do you get? In the next step, you get J equals to in the next step, you get J equals to I right here. You want J, right? So in the next step, what you get is 1 plus J equals to 2 into X minus X1 in the next step. 2 into X minus X1 by L. Now J equals to 2 into X minus X1 by L minus 1. This is the expression for natural coordinate J. J equals 2 into x minus x1 by L minus 1. This is the expression for natural coordinate J. If you observe here, the length of the element that doesn't change. X1 it represents the coordinate position of node 1 that also doesn't change. What is variable here? X. If you observe this carefully, J varies with respect to X linearly. The variation is linear. The variation between the natural coordinate J and the global coordinate X is linear. Therefore, if you make a plot between the global coordinate x and the natural coordinate j, you get straight line. That is one point. Another point. At node 1, x equals to x1. At node 1, x equals to x1. Come here and observe. At node 1, x equals to x1. So therefore, when you put x equal to x1, J equals to 2 into x1 minus x1 by L, 0 you get here. And J equals to minus 1. That is what I said. And you can also see here, J equals to minus 1 at node. Next, at node 2, x equals to x2. Therefore, when you put x equals to x2, 2 into x2 minus x1 by L, you get 2 minus 1. That is 1. J equal to plus 1 at node 2. At node 2 j equals to plus 1. As the value of j varies from minus 1 to plus 1, length of the element is covered. And at midpoint of the element, what is the midpoint coordinate? You can see here, the midpoint coordinate is x1 plus x2 by 2. Therefore, in this expression, if you put x equal to x1 plus x2 by 2, you get J equals to 0. The value of J at the midpoint of the element equals to 0. Right? Now, observe here carefully. <laughs> at node 1 x equals to x1, hence J equals to minus 1. As I said, at node 2 x equals to x equals to x2, hence J equals to plus 1. And you can visualize here the variation of j with respect to length of the element. j equals to minus 1 at node 1. j equals to minus 1 at node 1. This is node 1. j equals to plus 1 at node 2. And j equals to 0 at the midpoint. Midpoint C. Okay. The coordinate j is varying linearly with respect to length of the element length of the one dimensional. The natural coordinate j we use for one dimensional problems. A bar loaded in tension, a bar loaded in compression. It is the example for one dimensional problem. And one dimensional beam problems. A cantilever supporting end point load. A bar of uniform cross section supporting end point load with one and fix it. It is a cantilever, a bar of uniform cross section with one end fixed and supporting a transverse load at the end. It is a cantilever. 
a bar of uniform cross section with one end fixed and supporting uniformly distributed load acting in the transverse direction. It is a one dimensional beam problem. For all the one dimensional problems, you can use the natural coordinate J. Okay. What are the properties of the natural coordinate? The value of the natural coordinate varies from minus 1 to plus 1. The length of the element is varied as i varies from minus 1 to plus 1. Right? The natural coordinate j is used for one dimensional problems. Natural coordinate j is the derived coordinate and it is the local coordinate. Okay? Natural coordinate j is used to derive the properties of the element. Now, shear functions. When you take uh, the problems involving elasticity, in problems involving elasticity, the basic unknowns are the field variables. Take, as I said, a bar of uniform cross section, a simple problem with one end fixed and apply a tensile force F. What is the tensile force? Pull is the tensile force. Pull produces elongation in the member. Right? Elongation in the member in the direction of loading. Now, so here when you apply a pull F along the X of this member, a point on the surface of the element or at the interior moves in the direction of the force. Therefore, this point has only one displacement. It cannot move in other directions. If you consider a point on the surface of the member or at the interior, it moves in the direction of the force here. Yeah. It cannot move in other directions. It has only one displacement. Okay? Now, this is the displacement known as field variable, which is the basic unknown in this problem of elasticity. Once you determine this displacement, you can obtain the strain, then stress. You can use Hooke's law to determine the stress. Once you get the strain, you can determine the associated stress. So here the displacement u is a function of variable x only because it is one dimensional problem. The geometry of the domain, the material properties and other dependent parameters are dependent on only one variable x. Right? Now, where do you determine the field variable? Where do you determine this basic unknown? At the nodes of the elements. At the nodes of the elements. The same bar I take, this is the bar representing domain. Now, I discretize this domain into subdomains. How many subdomains do you consider? You take as many as possible. If you want, you can. Otherwise, you know, take the less number of elements with fewer nodes. Thereby, you get the solution in so less time. Now, I take two elements. What type of element you can choose here? One dimensional element. One dimensional element connects two nodes. This is node 1, this is one. One dimensional element. Each node has only one degree of freedom. Each node has only one degree of freedom. This node has one degree of freedom in this direction. This node has one degree of freedom in this direction. Hence, in this element, how many degrees of freedom are there? Only two. Because each node has one degree of freedom, there are two degrees of freedom in this element. Now, again, we come back to this problem. How many elements are there? Two finite elements. Finite elements. Element number is uncircled. To distinguish the element number from the node number. Right? Now, where do you consider the nodes? This is one node. This is another node. Node 2. This is third node. Right? Node we always represent by 
putting a round mark, dot. So this is one node. Next, this is another node. Second node. This is third node. Node 1, node 2, node 3. Node 1, node 2, node 3. The cross section of this member is same. When you consider one dimensional element, the cross section of the element is same throughout its length. Therefore, conventionally you can represent you know, this finite element model by drawing a line like this with length equal to length of this member and mark the nodes at the respective locations like this. And give node numbering 1, 2, 3. Where is first node? From here to here. Sorry. Where is first element? From here to here. This is element 1. Where is second element? From node 2 to node 3. This is second. Understand? Now, because it is one dimensional problem, each node has one degree of freedom. Node 1 has one degree of freedom, like this. This is one displacement. I can say U1. What is U1? Displacement of node 1. And node 2 has another displacement, U2. And node 3 has the displacement, U3. How many displacements are there at the nodes? In total, three displacements with one displacement at each node. Where u1, u2, and u3 are the nodal displacements. Because it is the problem of elasticity, I can say nodal displacements. If you want, in general, they are said to be nodal field variables. Nodal field variables. How many nodal field variables are there? Three. You can also call them basic unknowns at the nodes. Okay. Now determined by finite element method u1, u2 and u3. Once you determine u1, u2 and u3, can you determine the displacement at any point on the finite element, yes, it is possible by finite element. If I consider a point here, this is not the node. This is not the node. In this element, this is not the node. This is a point at the end. By finite element method, where you determine field variables at the nodes. Once you determine field variables at the nodes, you can determine you know, the field variable at any other point on the element. How it is possible? By interpolating functions. These interpolating functions are known as shape functions. Therefore, we must have to discuss about the shape functions. Shape functions are the interpolating functions. First point to know. Share functions are the interpolating functions. Or you can say, share functions are the approximating functions. They are used to interpolate nodal field variables with the unknown field variable. The field variable at this point is unknown. That is you. That I don't know. That I have to determine. When do you determine? When you know the nodal field variables u1, u2 and u3. To determine the unknown field variable at any point of interest on the element, you want shear functions, interpolating functions. You can say approximating functions. So therefore, shear functions are the interpolating functions, first point. They are used to interpolate nodal field variables. In this case, u1, u2 and u3 are the nodal field variables. They are used to interpolate nodal field variables with unknown field variable at the point of interest in the element. 
Share functions are very, very important. These share functions we can derive for one dimensional problem, two dimensional problems, and three dimensional problems also. Understand? Now, because share function is an interpolating function. You want a function to interpolate nodal field variables with unknown field variables. So what type of function you choose, that is the question. Normally we prefer polynomials. Why do we choose polynomials? Polynomials are easy to handle. Because integration is easy. Differentiation is also easy. That is the reason why we choose polynomials as the shape functions. Right? Now, we shall see here the approximation of non-linear one-dimensional polynomial with polynomials of different order. Observe carefully here we have a polynomial, one-dimensional polynomial. It is non-linear. It is not linear polynomial. It is a polynomial of single variable x. This one. It is not linear. It is non-linear. Observe the nature of this. It is non-linear. How do you approximate? If you approximate this one-dimensional non-linear polynomial by a linear polynomial. What is the form of linear polynomial? Say, you know, y equals to constant. So here u represents the displacement. Then, to approximate this polynomial, I can choose a linear function like this. u equals to some constant alpha. But, if this polynomial exactly fitting to this non-linear polynomial? No. Right? So therefore, my choice is not correct. This polynomial is not approximated well by this linear polynomial. So my choice is not correct. If I choose this polynomial to approximate this non-linear polynomial, I get much, I get much error. Therefore, my choice is not correct. Now, what I do is, again, I take the same non-linear one-dimensional polynomial, this one, again. One-dimensional non-linear polynomial, same polynomial right here. It is represented by this, u of x. Instead of a linear polynomial without variable x, I take a linear polynomial involving the variable x like this in the form of say y equals to mx plus c. Here y equals to constant. It appears in the form of say y equals to constant. So here it is in the form of say y equals to mx plus c. Which also represents a straight line. So here this polynomial is Closely fitting to the non-linear polynomial u, even though there is some error. You get some error, but when you compare these two, in this case you get more error. So here, the non-linear polynomial u is approximated by a linear polynomial u equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 into x. Right? Now, again, instead of taking a linear polynomial like this, if I take a non-linear polynomial like this, in the form of, say, u equal to a plus bx plus a cx square, instead of a, b, c, I have taken, you know, the options alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha. They are the generalized constants. This is a non-linear polynomial. 
of order two. It is a polynomial of zeroth order, a polynomial of first order, a polynomial of second order. Now see how the given nonlinear polynomial u is well approximated by a polynomial of second order. In this case, you know the error is very very small. You get better approximations. You get better approximations. Right? In next class we can see you know the derivation of shape functions. Thank you. Thank you very much.